Dee Kelly for being with us again. Uh, uh, just a couple reminders before uh, I turn this over to Dr. Kelly, uh, and that is that your microphone is on mute when you log in. We need it to stay that way, and it's necessary in order for us all to have a really quality experience, is not to have background noise and uh, hearing people click on and click off and all those things that have happened in the past and which we are really sorry about and with our aborted try um, a couple months ago. So this should work beautifully. Uh, you can ask a question. Uh, you have that capability and when you do it'll show up for me to um, share with Dr. Kelly. Uh, you must keep um, your phone on mute. Uh, also, do, don't put your phone on hold because then if it plays music or whatnot, everybody's going to hear that. Uh, if you need to want to ask a question, there should be a chat option that shows up on your screen and it says type message here. Uh, that would be perfect. So other than that, I think we're ready to get going. We're up to over 100 attendees. That's wonderful. Welcome everybody and let's get started. Dr. Kelly? Well, thank you for having me, and hey, I'm glad we have such a nice crowd today. Mm -hmm. So if we can pull the PowerPoint presentation up, that would help. Yes, ma'am. Give me one second. It went black on me. <laughs> no problem. Um, today we're going to talk about when we suspect you have a, a child who may have a disability but has not been serviced through the school. These are some, some tips, some ways to start that designation process. Um, in the medical field, it's called a diagnosis when you have a, a disorder, an illness. For school purposes, it's called a designation, and um, that's the difference. So this is a way to get your student designated as a student with a disability, if that is, in fact, something that needs The PowerPoint to come up. Hey, I apologize, Dr. Kelly. I'll, I'll catch up with you in just a moment. It, it um, was there and it locked out, but I will have it momentarily. That's okay. Stuff happens. Okay. It is amazing that we're all in different parts of the state, yet we can get the we can coordinate and help each other out. It's great. If you want to take some of the questions until we start, Patty, we could do that. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing that anybody has a question. I see some raised hands, but I think that was... I have one that uh, was forwarded to me. I'll start with that. Okay, good idea. Um, it said, I have noticed that when placements are changed, and this happens often, the schools change. Sometimes there is a delay in the child going to school, sometimes for a week or two. For a child with disabilities, this can be even more complex. And then there's a second half question about Medicare. Uh, I'm not going to do with the, deal with the Medicare today because that's not my area of expertise, but I will deal with the school. Um, when a child is enrolled in school, legally they have to accept that student the very next day once they're enrolled. They can't um, delay because they don't have a placement for that student. That's the law. But common sense tells us that when we have a student who's being enrolled in a school, we want an appropriate prepared placement for them. So what I do is I ask the school, how many days will you need? And if it's more than a couple or three days, that's not acceptable. Um, it, it certainly, if it's four days, five days, longer than that, then you need to ask the district how they are going to compensate that student for that missed time. Uh, will they push in some tutoring? Will they push in some uh, extra help during the school day? So that would be my, my answer to that question. It shouldn't take any time at all, but if it does for functional purposes, if it takes more than a couple days, then you're going to need to start asking how are we making this time up because the student
How are we doing with the PowerPoint? It's slow, uh, but it's almost there. It's, it's same starting. Um, it just um, my I don't know if we had a power surge or something here, but my whole computer went flat. But it's coming oh no. back up. Oh no! Okay. <laughs> Uh, Patty, are there any questions on the chat? I have new, um, I'm looking here. Patty, this is Kelly. I just emailed you three questions. They're actually coming through on the question bar, not the chat yep. bar. I gotcha. Okay. okay. I have it now. Kelly, you're ready to go. Okay. Ready? All right. We'll, we'll get back to the questions, folks. Hang in there. And um, so now that we have the PowerPoint up. Alrighty, so steps to getting a child designated as a student with a disability. Next. Okay, next. Oops. Oh no. Hold on, please. That's okay. If 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 this is going to be difficult, there we go. So first, you look for red flags that a student may be a student with a disability. Uh, obviously, your first clue is the child is having some issues at school. Those issues can be academic. When you look through the file, see, has this student been retained? Um, a lot of times, I'll do file reviews, and I will see that a student was retained in kindergarten or in first grade. And then they will say that they were administratively process into the next grade. They were administratively promoted. And what that means is the child didn't pass the grade. They just, for purposes of, uh, for social reasons, basically, they moved the child into the next class. So if you see a student who was retained more than once or administratively promoted, that's a huge red flag that they're not keeping up. Uh, poor grades is another one. What I want to say about poor grades, however, is this. Four grades alone should never, ever be the reason that a child is not looked at as having a, a possible disability. Grades, as you probably know, are uh, they're an amalgam of a lot of things. Uh, mostly they're things like uh, participation, how well the teacher likes the child, can they do small group work, did they hold, hand in their homework. So we have students with severe disabilities who have gotten through school with E's and D's. So grades alone should not be an indicator. Um, behavioral, and we all know about that, suspensions, expulsions, restraints. I like to ask for separately in the file because they are held separately in most schools, so you might not get them in your educational records, any and all incident reports relative to the students. So, they may have a lot of behavioral incident forms. They may also have what are called concern of harm forms, where the student was believed to be uh, a harm to himself or others. Those things will be in the file, but they may be held separate from the CUM file. You will need to ask for them separately. Next. Okay, diagnosis. A lot, it is more difficult, it is not impossible, it is simply more difficult to have a student designated as having a disability for the purposes of special education without a diagnosis. So look through, it depends on what designation you want for the child, but look through the file um, and provide all diagnoses to the school. What I do is I provide the last page of any kind of a medical document. It will have the physician's signature, and it will probably have DSM material. It'll say uh, ADHD, ODD, uh, mood dysphoria disorder, uh, bipolar disorder, mood disorder. It'll have any number of things on there. All you need to provide, you don't need to provide a lot. You just need to provide that diagnosis with a physician's signature under it. The law states that you don't even need that. You just need to provide them that notice that that is a student with disability. But I think for everyone's peace of mind, it's good to get that with the signature sheet. Um, and if the child does not have a diagnosis and you, you have a child with 
attention issues, impulse issues, behavior issues, you need to work with your uh, case managers and, and get that child to a pediatrician and have an evaluation done. And, and you know, what they'll do typically for ADHD is they will send forms to the school for the teachers to fill out. Uh, they will ask the foster parent to fill out some forms. Uh, but, but that needs to happen because we're talking about a disability. And if there is no designation or there's no diagnosis, that becomes increasingly difficult. So request evaluation. So you think that you have a kid who may have a disability, right? You look at this file and they've got, you know, an extensive history of failure or even a, a real acute recent history of failure. Um, you have to request the evaluation. So no one can receive special education services without being evaluated. Uh, you can bring in all the documentation in the world that says this is a child with X, Y, or Z, but until that school does the evaluation, they will not be designated as having a need under special education. Um, you request that the uh, evaluation be done in all suspected areas of disability. Many districts will prefer to do a very narrow evaluation. They will say, uh, you know, Johnny can't read. So they will do a very narrow reading evaluation when it's true that Johnny also can't do math. He also has behavioral issues and he's got attentional issues. So you ask for all suspected areas of disability and that will be done at a meeting where you discuss what's necessary, discuss what your concerns are, why you have those concerns, and ask for those evaluations. Uh, you put your request in writing always, always. When you make that initial request for an evaluation, if you say it to them, legally it did not happen. So what I suggest you do is send an email to the principal of the school or someone in the ESC department, the special ed department, ESC stands for Exceptional Student Education, and you can get those contacts from the district's website, and you send, and what you say is, uh, due to the issues, you introduce yourself, obviously, and due to the issues student Y is having, we are requesting an evaluation in all suspected areas of disability. Next. Coming. All right. So the school, after you send that email, the school must obtain written consent within 20 days at your request for an evaluation. So you send that email, right? Well, within 20 days, they have to have a meeting and get a signature for, for what it is that they're going to be doing. The consent form must be signed before the school can evaluate. So you have to come in, you have to give your signature, or whoever is the legal voice for the child, whether that's the, care, the case manager or whether that's the foster parent. But someone has to sign that consent for evaluation. If they choose not to um, evaluate, um, then you probably need to contact someone or uh, call the ESC department and explain again why you view um, that that needs to be done. Very rarely do schools decline to evaluate. Okay. So the evaluation timeline. Evaluations have to be completed 60 days. Back one. There you go. 60. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, I think we need to be back one. Uh, schools need to evaluate within 60 days from the date that the consent form was signed. That excludes holidays. Um, so you'll have to work around holidays. But it is um, 60 calendar days, not 60 work days. Um, the refusal to evaluate, uh, the school must provide the, the parent or whoever is in charge uh, with a written notice explaining why they refuse to do it. Uh, and that notice must be provided within the 20 days. Next. Dr. Kelly, 
Uh, this is Maddie. Can you get as close to your phone and speak up a little bit more? People are saying they can hear me when I was talking, <laughs> but not you. So if you is, is this any better? I think that's louder for me, although I heard you fine before, but hopefully that's better for everyone. I apologize. Go ahead. Keep going. Dr. Kelly? Uh -oh. Are you there, Patty? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. The school, okay, once you've signed the consent and the, the evaluations are complete, they must have a, uh, an evaluation meeting, an eligibility meeting. And during that meeting, uh, what they do is they review all of the documents. They review all of the evaluations. If the child is eligible under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, they will recommend that he be placed in ESE or in special ed. Um, they will develop a plan that speaks to the child's specific educational needs, and they will talk about what educational services and related services are appropriate for addressing the needs. Now, services and related services are things like speech therapy, occupational therapy, a sensory diet for students with sensory disorders, Related services are things like transportation and any other services. Next. Okay. If, if the child is found to be eligible under IDEA, they have to create an IEP, an Individual Educational Plan. And that is meant to be the roadmap for moving forward with this student. This tells the district what you're going to do differently for this child than you do for every other child in the school. The IEP should include their present levels of academic performance and functional performance. That means where are they now. It should have a baseline for reading and for math. It should say things like uh, Tommy can read at a second grade level. If the information in that section is hard for you to decipher, if they're using things like he reads at a VLT 1.2. I've seen things like that. If they're not understandable to the typical parent, they shouldn't be in there. So please ask them to say, what grade level is that? Can you give me a grade level for that? Things you need to be able to understand the document. You put in the goals, what areas uh, that the school will be working on. Typically, there are academic goals and behavioral goals. Uh, accommodations. Accommodations are what are the things that we're going to do to level the playing field for this student. So it might be extended time for testing. It might be the ability to test and retest. It may be small group environment. It could be things uh, such as uh, access to the nurse at will for students with uh, medical plans. It could be uh, healthcare related, it could be really anything. Uh, related services, again, transportation typically comes to mind for that. And it should include a section of conference notes. This is very important. You want all of your concerns annotated in the conference notes. Anything they promise you should go in the conference notes. If they tell you that the teacher will make a communication plan with you or whomever, that should be in the conference notes. If they promise that someone will stay after and tutor, conference notes. If they say that they will have extra support in the classroom, conference notes. Legally, if it is not in that IEP or the attached conference notes, it didn't happen. So don't be afraid to advocate that anything they've told you they will do will go in those conference notes. And if they don't, ask them to annotate that they won't put that in the conference notes. Next. There we go. Now, Florida has, interestingly enough, more areas of eligibility uh, for a provision of, of exceptional education than the federal statutes do. The federal statutes have uh, 11 areas of disability or eligibility. In Florida, we have more than that. So here they are in Florida. These are the reasons or these are the designations not diagnoses, these are the designations under which you can receive exceptional student education in the state of Florida. Autism spectrum disorder, 
deaf or hard of hearing. Florida has ages birth through five. That includes kids that you don't have a designation for really, you don't have a diagnosis, you don't know what's going on, you just know they're not meeting their, uh, their milestones, their developmental milestones. Birth through two years, the exact same thing. Established conditions, ages birth through two years old, same thing, you know you've got a child with cerebral palsy, it's an established condition. Developmentally delayed, this is the big box. This is where most of the kids enter school with a DD designation. Typically, they don't have to be more specific with a small child because you don't really know what's going on. Kids typically come into school with the DD designation and by the time they are six years old, that must be removed from the IEP and they must find one of these other areas of eligibility if the child is going to continue to receive exceptional education. Ages three through five, same thing, the global category. Next, developmentally delayed, ages three through five, we just spoke about that. Dual sensory impairment, that would be deaf, blind. Emotionally, emotional and behavioral disability, EBD, gifted, homebound or hospitalized, typically that's called hospital homebound, intellectual disability or language impairment. Hospital homebound is often used if a child cannot be in school, either through a medical issue such as uh, the student has leukemia, the student has an illness, or can also be used for children with school phobias, with children who are so behaviorally disordered that they cannot attend uh, the public school. Next. The other ones are other health impairment, and we'll talk about that a little specifically later. Orthopedic impairment, specific learning disability, we'll touch on that in a minute. Speech impairment, traumatic brain injury, or visual impairment, and that is for students who are blind and partially sighted, but do not rise to the level of blindness. Next. Back one, there we go. Specific learning disability. Now, the statute has a lot of kind of gobbledygook in the law. What it basically means is a specific learning disability is defined as a disorder in one or more of the basic learning processes involved in understanding or using language, spoken or written, that may manifest in significant difficulties affecting the ability to listen, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematics. Associated conditions may include, but are not limited to, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, and developmental aphasia. Dyslexia is a reading disorder. Uh, my personal editorial on it is that it, kids are overdiagnosed with dyslexia, but it doesn't really matter. Any kind of reading disorder is still covered under the statute. Dyscalculia is kids who have math difficulties. Dysgraphia, kids who have difficulty writing, and not because of a motor issue, but it's a brain issue, it's a neurological issue. They can't get it down on paper. Or developmental aphasia, and that is a developmental issue where children cannot speak as fluently as typical kids. So a specific learning disability doesn't, have, uh, doesn't include learning problems that are primarily a result of a visual, hearing, motor, intellectual, or emotional behavioral disability, limited English proficiency, or environmental, cultural, or economic factors. For kids in dependency, that, that sentence becomes very important. We know the kids we deal with are often out of school for periods of time. They have had many transitions in their lives. Schools will sometimes try, and try to use that sentence about environmental factors to say, well, we can't, we can't really tell if the student is learning disabled or not because they haven't been in school or they've had so much upheaval. Um, there are ways around that. Uh, what you do is you look to see, is it a global deficit? For instance, if the kid is just bad in everything, then maybe that is, you know, due to being out of school. But if you have a student who does math very well but can't read, 
Well, well, then obviously attendance isn't the problem because he can do math. So those are the things you look at. You may need to advocate uh, for getting a student identified as having a specific learning disability. Next. Autism spectrum disorder. I think we a lot of us know about this. This is a huge box in the state of Florida. I have seen an increase in um, identification under ASD uh, when kids present with any kind of unknown neurological issue with symptoms that mimic ASD. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger box. Um, it's defined as a range of pervasive developmental disorders. If you see PDD or pervasive developmental disorder on a child's, uh, in a child's file, typically that's a precursor to autism. They don't like to label small kids with autism, so they use PDD. Typically that will just segue into a diagnosis as ASD. And it adversely affects a student's functioning and results in the need for specially designed instruction and related services. Autism spectrum disorder is characterized by an uneven developmental profile, a pattern of qualitative impairments in social interaction, communication, and the presence of restricted repetitive and stereotype patterns of behaviors, interests, and activities. The things that are most important here for advocates are this. If you suspect that your student has ASD, and even if ASD is a medical diagnosis in the file, you need to make sure that that student has a language screening done or a language assessment done. Because without the presence of a communication disorder, they will not be designated as having autism spectrum disorder for the purposes of education. Even with a medical diagnosis, they still need to make an educational designation as having autism. And for that, they will look for that language issue. They will also look for stereotyped patterns of behavior. The best advocacy tip I can give you for that is these kids are uh, typically inflexible and um, need routine. And when their routine is broken up, they may act out. And I use that as the stereotype pattern of behavior. Um, and that's about it. We can talk about that if anybody has any questions on that. Um, next. Other health impaired. Other health impaired is kind of an interesting category. Um, the statute says that it means having limited strength, vitality, or alertness, including a heightened alertness to environmental stimuli that results in limited alertness with respect to the educational environment that is due to a chronic or acute health problem. It includes, but not limited to, asthma, attention deficit disorder, or ADHD, Tourette syndrome, diabetes, epilepsy, heart condition, hemophilia, lead poisoning, leukemia, nephritis, rheumatic fever, sickle cell anemia, and acquired brain injury. This also applies to diagnoses of mental illness. Um, what is interesting about this is the statute started out saying that the student needed to have limited strength, vitality, or alertness. Well, that didn't work because kids with ADHD aren't really, they don't really fit into any other category. So they needed to shoehorn them into this category in order to serve them. And so then they added this odd caveat that they have limited, they have heightened alertness to everything else. So then they have limited alertness to their educational environment. Um, you know. It was just kind of a fiction of law that needed to be done to provide coverage for kids with ADHD. If you have a student who, and we're going to talk about emotional behavioral disorder in just a second, but if you have a student that they are leaning toward emotional behavioral disorder, but they have a medical mental health diagnosis, always advocate for other health impaired based on that diagnosis. Um, and it's because of the stigmatization that goes with emotional and behavioral disorder. Other health impaired, that makes it sound like a medical issue. Staff is much more sympathetic to a student with an OHI impairment than they will be to an EBD impairment. Next. OK, EBD, emotional behavioral disability. I always call this BAD. Um, a student with an emotional behavioral disability has a persistent, 
that's not sufficiently responsive to implemented evidence based on intervention and consistent emotional and behavioral responses that adversely affect performance in the educational environment that cannot be attributed to age, culture, gender, or ethnicity. Now, there are only two categories where they need to do interventions before they will make a designation, and they are uh, SLD, Specific Learning Disability, and EBD, Emotional and Behavioral Disability. Both of those designations, they need to do some kind of interventions to see if they can correct the problem before labeling the kid as having a disability. They will say to you, when you ask for an evaluation, they will say to you, can we do the RTI process, they may call it, they may call it MTSS, they may call it PST, but what they're asking is to be able to do interventions before they start the evaluation. Your answer is always no. You may do them concurrently with the evaluations. I have seen many, many students end up in intervention limbo year after year after year not making any progress. So of course they need to do those interventions to designate them either speech or uh, specific learning disability or EBD, but they need to do them concurrently. You have the right to have them done concurrently. Do not delay the rest of the evaluation for that. Okay, next. If you do not agree with the evaluations, you may request an independent educational evaluation, IEE, if you disagree with the results of the evaluation. The school must either agree, pay for the evaluation, or file for a due process hearing to show that the assessment, their assessment was appropriate. And if you are granted an IE, you may pick the provider. So the way this works is if you feel that their evaluation was way off base, and I'll just give you a quick example. We had an evaluation done for a client recently where all of the outside data documented the fact that this student was a student. Uh, who was an autism spectrum student. The school said, everything's fine here, nothing to see. And their evaluation, it was a couple of screenings they had done, uh, teacher reports, said, no, there's, there's no problem here. Well, we asked for an IEE, an independent educational evaluation, as a tiebreaker, you know, to, to get more information on what really was going on with that student. That would be a good reason to do it. Um, and if you do decide to do that, consult your supervisors. Feel free to send me an email uh, to ask how you proceed with that. It's not difficult, but uh, you may want a little guidance on that. Next. That was the last slide. Okay. Is that it? OK, that's it. All right. Thank you, everybody, for sitting through that. Do we have any questions? We have lots of questions. Hey! <laughs> yeah, so um, let's try to get through them, and some of them might have already been answered, but okay. and if you can always just, you know, address this any way you want, Dr. Kelly. Okie okay. dokie. Um, one of the first questions asked was, what's the, what is the difference between an IEP and a 504? Okay, so a 504 plan is given to any student who has a disability who needs accommodations. Accommodations are what we do to level the playing field, okay? It's extra time on things. It's small group testing. It's being able to take some days off and then have time to make up later. It is done for a student with a disability. The standard is much lower. Um, the Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights have said if there's any doubt at all the kid has a disability, give them a 504 plan. And I'd be glad to do a training um, on 504 specifically because it is interesting. Um, a 504 plan, though, is just accommodations. Special education needs, you need to have individualized instruction that is different than other students. Your instruction, your curriculum part of it needs to be different. That might mean you need to be in a small group all day. That may mean you need access to social skills because you just can't stop making drama at school. 
that may mean you need a, a slower curriculum. It could mean you uh, need to be in a room with a higher ratio because you act out often during the school day. But it's something specific to you that can't be taken care of by just an accommodation. Next. Okay. We're ready for the next one? Mm -hmm, sure. OK. Um, because I keep coming in. All right. Does um, a request for an evaluation trump RTI? Yes. <laughs> Was that fast enough? Yes. Um, okay. What they will do is they will say, you know, well, let's do RTI. And your response is always, great. We're going to do it concurrently. OK. All right. Great. Um, OK. What is an emotional behavior disability? Um, well, we just went through that. It, you know, the, the easy way is it, is it is something about that child's emotional makeup or behavior pattern that signals that they need individualized instruction. So a lot of times, uh, they will try to put kids with ADD, uh, ODD, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, um, in EBD. Um, if you have a kid who has problem behaviors, but they don't have a medical diagnosis of ADHD, ADHD, ODD, mood dysregulation disorder, bipolar disorder, uh, rage disorder, there's a thousand of them. If they don't have a medical diagnosis, they're going to end up in emotional and behavioral disorder. I can promise you that. Uh, what they do for that is they get reports from teachers. They ask about the child's behavior. Um, and if the child is shown to have behaviors that are concerning, statistically different than the rest of the class, then they will go into EBD. They will become a student with an emotional behavioral disorder. OK. All right, uh, what is DSM? <laughs> it's it's the uh, it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's the DSM five. Is I think the last one. It's, they're working on the DSM six. Maybe they're on the DSM six. Uh, it's a great resource if any of you have them in your offices because it can kind of uh, even if the student has ADHD, you can look at that. You can copy a page out of that, and you can take that. You can also get it at a library. Uh, and you can take a page with you to advocate for the student, saying, look, this disorder says this student will do these typical things here. So I think that's what we're talking about. Um, if you ever have to go to an expulsion hearing, um, I think it's also a handy thing to bring along a, a copy of uh, the ramifications or the manifestations of any of those kids' diagnoses because the district can see that probably what they did was simply a manifestation of the disorder they have. So that's the DSM. OK. Um, OK, one guardian says, I have a three-year-old with DXPSTD, diagnosis of PSTD, I guess. Does he need to be receiving services other than counseling to ensure his success in school? Um, I, I would say based on the manifestations of that child's PTSD, yes, but it depends on how it manifests. If he's, um, if he's a student who internalizes that trauma and is just very, very quiet, I still would ask for a 504 plan so that teachers are aware that that student will need to be handled with trauma-informed care um, so that teachers can check for meaning because a student with PTSD who is internalized will sit and um, have a great deal of difficulty uh, accessing the material that's being said. Uh, they may be thinking of other things. And so you always want to check to make sure the student is following along, the student is in an okay place emotionally. Um, if the student has fear manifestations, if they are sensitive to sound, noise, uh, if they are that fight or flight kid based on the PTSD, then I would definitely ask for a um, ESE evaluation because you may need things like access to uh, you know a quiet place or he may need specific instructions 
on some of these skills that can't be handled through uh, counseling as a related service. So child dependent, but I am a firm believer in a child who has been that traumatized to over service rather than under service. Okay, or they keep pouring in. So we're going to try to get through all of them. If we don't, sure. the, I'm, I'm good. Time, I, will, I will address what, you know, how we'll get these Perfect. Questions. Yeah, okay. I, I don't have an appointment till two, so <laughs> I'm good. Okay, question regarding the physician evaluation slash diagnosis. I have a child on one of my cases who's having severe behavioral and academic issues. He is receiving tutoring services in math and English, and he has seen a psychiatrist to obtain medication in addition to continuing his regular therapy sessions. I am still concerned over the issues he's having in school, which do not seem to have been helped through the you know, medication. All right. Uh, I happen to be an English and special needs teacher, and his behavior is very concerning, especially considering his medical history. Would you recommend requesting an evaluation by his pediatrician, or would the psychiatrist therapist already have administered a similar evaluation? If you have a diagnosis in the file, right, it's, so the student's being seen by a psychiatrist for med management, I assume. Based on that, there should be a designation or a diagnosis, excuse me, in the file. Because typically, you know, we just don't medicate kids, you know, give psych psychotropics to kids who don't have some kind of diagnosis. So I would look there. If you're unhappy with what you see there, I would ask for a uh, pediatrician referral to someone who can uh, provide more insight into what's going on with that child. Um, you know, I know we're dealing with Medicaid, and I know we're dealing with overworked people, but if you can possibly get a referral to uh, some place like Nemours or Shands, um, I think it just saves you a lot of trouble down the road, and it will help that child greatly going down the road. But yeah, that kid needs an, a school evaluation. If the child has not been evaluated for a disability by the school, they, they certainly need to be so, do so. And, and I'll tell you the reason why. Um, if a child is having behavioral difficulties, that child is going to start to get suspended. Uh, and as they grow older, the likelihood of them being arrested at school uh, grows exponentially. The only protection that child has against being expelled from that school district is the protection that an IEP or a 504 plan would provide. And the, perfection, the protection they provide is they say you cannot throw them out of school. You have to provide services to these kids because these kids are disabled and we don't throw our disabled citizens away. So for that reason alone, to protect him from being over suspended, expelled, or arrested, I would say yes, absolutely. Get him evaluated as soon as possible through the school. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, if a child is diagnosed with a mental health disorder such as schizophrenia, we should advocate for an OHI, question mark? I would. I would. I, I, again, it's for the stigmatization thing. Uh, EBD, uh, you know, I, I've worked in education for 30 years and I developed EBD programs and I absolutely love those kids, but I realized that the rest of those kids or the rest of those kids are viewed by the rest of the staff in the school as being simply BAD. There are kids that, you know, typically don't have mental health disorders, they're conduct disordered, meaning there's really nothing wrong with them other than they're kind of criminally. So um, I would try to get an OHI designation. I would say make the argument that the schizophrenia did indeed limit their alertness to educational material. I mean, my God, when you're having atypical thinking and thoughts, it's a little hard to access your education. And so I would use that, and I would kind of, you know, uh, kind of, I don't want to say defy them to come up with another answer, but I would respectfully ask them to follow along with my thinking. So. Okay. Um, I am a gal, and I have a 16-year-old male child that has poor grades, no motivation or determination, and is showing subtle signs of mental illness. Case management wants to close the case, but I'm against it. I know that I need to notify my CAM of my concerns. If the parents are willing to sign the papers for him to see a doctor, is that all I need to do to initiate the process? 
There's a lot going on in that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so first of all, I can't, you know, I can't speak to what you need to do with your case manager and what in uh, her clothes in the file. But I can tell you, if, if the child is showing failure at school, um, either socially, behaviorally, or academically, you have the right to ask for the, that evaluation, even without a diagnosis from the physician. I think I would start that process concurrently. If, if you look like you're running out of time on a kid's file, I would ask the school to start the evaluation, and then I would probably say to anyone else, um, look, you know, school has agreed that there's something going on with this student. Could we please get a uh, physician to look at this student, a pediatrician to look at this kid and see if they have reason to believe that there is um, either an emergent uh, mental disorder or there is a behavioral or attentional disorder like ADHD or, or just PTSD. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the way I would do it. I would probably start with the school simultaneously try to get a, a physician involved and then present that to anyone else and but always 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 I got to say this speak to your supervisor first and because you know Katie said so doesn't work <laughs> so yeah okay great all right um, I thought in the state of Florida school no longer retains students from moving to the next grade yes and no um, they they have mandatory retention in third grade and fifth grade uh, based on the FSA, the uh, Florida Standards Assessment, right, Common Core. So there is mandatory um, retention in those grades if they do not pass the state, uh, the state test. The good news is it is not automatic retention anymore because what the schools do now, because they had so many kids retained, um, what they've done is they've developed a portfolio system. So if the kid goes to summer school and works on this portfolio where they break down all the standards and they ask them uh, four questions on each standard uh, and they can test, retest that up to four times, uh, they will not have to retain them. Uh, that being said, any other grade they will be administratively promoted because it, we do not do uh, social uh, retention, and we don't do academic retention here. It's not good for the kids. It, it's not going to fix it. So, and if the student really cannot, is is there's a gap between what the next grade knows and what he knows, that's the time to ask for an evaluation again, because he should probably be in ESE, and he should probably be getting some specialized instruction to help catch up. Okay. Uh, why would gifted students need to be placed in ESE? Oh, um, because it gives them a plan to guarantee that they will be given gifted services. Um, we think of ESE as being this kind of negative thing. Um, I think of ESE as being kind of like the avenging angel of all students. And so gifted is under that. If, if a student has an IEP plan or an IP plan uh, for gifted, it guarantees them access to the services in that plan. So that's, that's why it's important. Okay. Okay, I, have no, I don't know what these initials are for, but if a child is DD, can they receive ESY services? <laughs> That's developmentally, developmentally delayed, okay. and that is extended school year services. Okay. And, uh, you know, the answer is um, I don't know. I think so. Uh, I do not typically deal with preschoolers. So, uh, but I would say, yeah, that um, there is generally in every district some kind of summer remediation plan uh, available to students. So I would have to say, yeah. Um, here is the standard for ESY, which is used to be called summer school and now it's just ESY extended school year. If you need ESY for the school to provide FAPE, which is a free and appropriate education, so if you need to be there in the summer to provide an appropriate education, then you get ESY. Um, and typically there are three ways that they show that you need that. 
and that is um, if you have an emerging skill, like you're just on the cusp of learning something like reading all your sight words or almost just passing that biology class. Um, if you have had a significant loss in the past of educational opportunity, which most of our students have, you qualify for ESY. Or if you regress in skills over the summer, uh, you are entitled to ESY. Typically, schools will go with a regression model and then will ask, tell you that they don't have data to support that. You know, good advocacy would call for you to say, hey, listen, this kid made no progress this year, so we need to do ESY so that he can have an appropriate education this past year. So there's an ESY tip. OK. Um, you mentioned children in dependency often miss a lot of school, and the school does not want to evaluate a child. Why would a school resist evaluating services for a child? <laughs> Well, because it's expensive, because they have to, they only have so many school psychologists in a district. They are, like a lot of us, they are overburdened. Um, once they designate a student, it kicks in a lot of federal protections. Sometimes they don't want to kick in those federal protections for students they believe is just problem children. Um, sometimes they don't want to start an evaluation because they don't think the kid is going to be there long enough and they just really haven't developed a relationship of caring with that student. Um, there are a lot of reasons why they resist doing that. Uh, but most of them get back to limited resources on the part of the school district and not wanting to spend those resources on a student that may or may not be there next year. Okay. Um, I have a child that is very smart, but her behavior is an issue. With a class of 20 students, how can we help this child without an IEP? Um, you know, if, if, it, if you think it's just some transitional behavior, you don't think it's, you know, a, a lifelong thing, um, I would ask for a behavioral observation and a behavior plan. Uh, the child needs a behavior plan if they're misbehaving. And so typically that's something like if, if she, you know, they'll make check marks through the day. Did she keep her hands to herself? Did she say kind words? If she did all those things, she gets a reinforcer at the end of the day, a ticket or an edible or, you know, pat in the back, whatever. Uh, so, but, but at the very least, the student should have a behavior plan developed by the district for her. Okay. Um, what remedies are there for our kids who have an IEP or 504 and the school violates the plan by expelling the student based on behaviors related to their disability? Well, it's kind of a tough one without knowing the facts. Um, because most of this stuff is very factually specific, most of the law. But I will tell you this, there is the triple crown of when they can expel anybody, and a disability or not. And that is if you are involved in drugs in the school, if you bring a weapon, and a weapon obviously can be a, a firearm, but it can also be a knife with a blade longer than two inches in Florida. So it's got to be a blade longer than two inches. And it is the length of the blade, not the length of the handle and the blade. And then the third thing is if you uh, commit serious uh, bodily injury on someone, and that typically won't ever be the standard because serious bodily injury through case law uh, involves uh, permanent disfiguration, permanent loss of a medical facility on the person. So typically that's not why they throw them out. It's either drugs or weapons. If it were not that, if it was a, a code violation, a code of conduct violation, then again, you need to uh, talk about that manifestation determination that's the meeting that has to be held for a student with a disability before they can be sent out to an alternative school. Um, and at that manifestation determination, you really need to advocate. And that's where you need to bring information. You can download it from the internet, from National Institute of Health, from wherever that talks about the behaviors that are to be expected 
from a student with your student's disability area. And, and, and I would even bring in uh, kids in care. You know, you can find stuff all over the internet about some of the behavioral manifestations attached to kids in care. So, and that's where you have to argue that. So, but without the facts, that's the best I can do on that, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay, it says, so if a child has an IEP, he cannot be dismissed from school. I have a kindergartner with an IEP, and they call the mom to pick him up a couple times a week. Yeah, that's real super common. Um, what I would advise is that the parent, uh, when they sign the child out, and they should be signing that child out every day, right on there, requested to be picked up for behavior, um, because I would make a paper trail. And uh, that parent also has a right to ask for a copy of that uh, page. You know, they can redact them and give them to them, but that's that child's educational record. Uh, and then I would just say, hey, listen, I'm being asked to pick this, you know, little nugget up every day. Uh, where are we with the behavior plan? Why aren't we working on keeping this student in school? So at that point, I would ask for a behavior plan. Because those are, those are legally exclusions. Those are considered exclusions. And you can only exclude a student up to, you know, 10 days for a, same, a similar pattern of behavior uh, before it becomes legally problematic for a, dis, uh, for a district. And that includes sending them home for half days. So, yeah, ask for a behavior plan and write down the reason you're picking them up when you pick them up. Okay. I'm going to do uh, one more question, and then I'm going to sure. address how other questions can get answered because I know there are some that I'm not going to quite yep. get and apologize for that. But okay, okay. What, are your, what are your concerns about overdiagnoses? What's the downside or is there one? You know, I, I frankly um, do not see uh, a downside unless it's EBD. Again, unless you're saying this kid is just kind of bad. Um, I absolutely do not see a downside. Um, you know, even talking about high-achieving students who will go on to college and graduate school, um, those designations provide them with protections and accommodations um, that they don't get otherwise. And so if, if a student is not making acceptable progress, then I would say by all means have them designated. Now, Ten years ago, there was a problem with the over-identification of African-American students as being both behaviorally disordered and intellectually disabled. Um, schools have pushed back against that to the point where now they don't want to identify African-American students sometimes. Um, that's a terrible error because then those, those kids don't get services. They don't get the help and then they don't get the federal protection either. So I, I am not concerned. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen, uh, because you're just, frankly, you're not going to qualify based on the results of the uh, evaluations. You know, if the numbers aren't there for the evaluations, you're not going to qualify for services. So I, I really don't worry too much about over-identification. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. And I think with all these questions coming in that we have a lot of ideas for okay, great. webinars, don't you, uh, about things that everybody would like to know about. Um, oh, I'd love that. Yeah, uh, there, oh. was, there were a couple questions that were asking about how to become an educational advocate, which I believe maybe was related to being a surrogate, educational surrogate or, or parent surrogate. And that you really need anybody who's wondering about that, please, please talk to your staff in your circuit office, in your program you office, you know, uh, because each school board has their own training and their own requirements. Um, so you need to do, you know, address, have that addressed locally. Um, okay, other than that, anybody who still has a question or if I didn't get to your question, which we didn't have time to do, please email them to me and I'll get them all together and send them to Dr. Kelly and she's wonderful about getting back to you. Um, so just send it to patty, P-A-T-T-Y dot walker at G-A-L 
.fl.gov. Um, and the other thing is I know a lot of folks have requested a copy of the PowerPoint. Yeah, you guys, can, you can have that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we're going to send that out to everyone. So, okay. yes, it will get sent out to all of you. And there was also a handout that will go along with it. Uh, and that should give you all a lot of information to hang on to as a very valuable resource. So uh, we've been getting a lot of thank you, thank you, thank yous from the attendees. Oh, yay. So, yay. Thank um, you. And if you have any feedback, please feel free to uh, send that. I know I I go quickly, and it's a lot of information. So right. you know, feel free to let me know what you need. Yes, we love feedback. So folks, just reach out, let us know what you think and anything we can do to improve it. And thank you so much for um, hanging in there with us and uh, sending along all those great questions. Have a wonderful day and go out and advocate for your child's education. Hey, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. Bye. Bye-bye. Kelly, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I was going to wait um, about five minutes or so if you can hang on the line. Um, yeah, I see the attendees are starting to log off. Yep. So if we just wait a little bit, we can continue talking in just a few moments. Sure. Sounds good. Okay, great.